Our God and our Father, we bless your name for keeping us alive. Thank you for making us to see a day like this. We thank you because of your grace that has flown into our lives as we have known the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. But we know you are looking for the practical expression of that grace and love. Therefore, Lord, we pray you'll open our eyes in your word so we will see how to make your love and your grace practical in our lives in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, so that we'll please you. We'll do what you want us to do. We'll go in the direction that will make you happy with our Christian living in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered, for we pray in Jesus' name. Today we're looking at Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Matthew 25, verses 31 through to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Fire was an hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? Then the king shall answer and say unto them verily i say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me then shall he say also unto them on the left depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for i was an hunger and ye gave me no meat i was thirsty and ye gave me no drink i was a stranger and ye took me not in Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Today we're looking at love, practical love that is, which is the very essence of the Christian life, the Christian ministry and Christian service. In the sight of God, and as we look into God's word and understand in proper perspective, love is not an abstract notion, but it's a practical quality. In this chapter, chapter 25 of Matthew, you will see that our Lord had eternity in view. And that was very special and specific for the Lord. He always had eternity in view. We're told in scriptures that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which means from eternity past, from thousands and millions of years, even before the beginning of the world, he had the future in mind. He had the human race in mind. He had a cross and a calvary in mind. And also when he came into this world, he was always looking at the future. He was always telling the people, destroy this temple, I'll build it up the third day. He told his own disciples that he'll be taken by wicked hands. He'll be killed, he'll be slain. He will shed his blood for the sins of the world. The third day, he will rise again. The Bible says he endured the cross because he set his face on the joy that he will have here thereafter. You see, that was the quality of the life of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, it is the weakness of our own lives. We do not look at the future enough. We do not think of eternity enough. 
We do not think of the kingdom of God and the second coming of the Lord and the rapture in all. Most of us will think of things present, things here and now, things around us at the present time. But you see, in this chapter, Jesus Christ looked at the future. In the first part of the chapter, he saw what will happen at the coming of his glory. When he depicted or he showed the human race under two categories, the wise and the foolish. And again, he was looking into the future. In the second part of the chapter, he was looking at the servants, the faithful and the unfaithful. In the third part, he was looking at the sheep and the goats. And he related the essence or the importance of the actions of the people to the effect or the consequence in eternity. He emphasized in this last part of the chapter that all the deeds of love that are done to other people in his name and for his sake are in effect done unto him. And he shows us how commendable brotherly love is. And it shows us also the condemnation that comes as a result of the neglect of mercy. That will be the center of what we're studying tonight, just two points. Number one, compassion and brotherly love. Number two, neglect of mercy and condemnation. Let's look at number one. Compassion and brotherly love. Let's look at it again from verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another. As a sheep, as a shepherd divideth a sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand. And the goats on the left. In this chapter, as I said, he emphasized the division, the separation that will come between the righteous and the unrighteous. The people who are watching and praying and the careless. The people who are faithful and the unfaithful. The people who are soft-hearted and lovingly giving to service like the sheep. And the people who are stubborn and rebellious and self-centered like the goat. He'll be looking at the two groups of people, the people who are pure in heart and those who are not pure in heart. And over here he says there'll be a time when he will sit upon the throne of his glory. Many people, because they do not know the future glory that Christ will have and that the believers will have with Christ, the thing that they can get all the glory and all the praise and the applause of men, they're looking for today. But Jesus said, he at that time will sit upon the throne of his glory. There will be the great divide. There will be the great separation. There will be the parting between the righteous and the unrighteous. And then he marks out the thing that characterizes the righteous people. And here is where we Christians, those of us who name the name of Christ, have to really study, have to really pray, have to really get what the Lord is looking for in our lives. You see, many of us have a lopsided, wrong notion or view of the Christian life. There are things that we think are important. And there are things we think are not important. And the Lord had warned us in the Old Testament that he does not see as man seeth. And yet we continue to see as man seeth. And we do not see at all as God alone can see. And you can see it in our evaluation of things. You can see it in the way we desire some things. You can see, you see, immediately somebody is born again. He sees other people that are great actors and great performers who display a lot of gifts and talent and ability. And you see that many of these Christians, they think that's the way God thinks. They think God is on the side of a great actor. It's on the side of a great performer. They think that when everybody is praising you and clapping for you and appreciating you that you are a public Christian figure, maybe a wonderful preacher, they think that is the most important in the sight of God. But here Jesus draws the curtain and he tells us the things that are very important and what God is really looking for. Most people will envy the few people who seem to be attracting the praise of their fellow men. The few people who seem to be attracting the clapping and the applause of people that are great performers. But God's verdict is not based on human evaluation. 
You see, the greatest investment is what you do for other people in Christian love and Christian service. And the greatest deeds are not the public performance, which friends may talk about or write about. In eternity, the unnoticed acts of love and compassion and mercy will be the things that God himself will reward. But it's unfortunate in the midst of Christian fellows and Christian believers that in the pursuit of the professional ministry, we establish colleges and training schools to teach people to perform, to act, to preach, to sing, and to do something that the public will be able to say, that is beautiful or that is fine. We never train people on what it means to really serve in love to really manifest the heart of the Christian ministry. There are many people that are running after being the great performers in Christian ministry and Christian service, and they're living the really essential thing, which is what the Lord talked about in this passage as feeding the hungry, helping the helpless, providing for the needy, clothing the naked, visiting and encouraging the sick, ministering and serving the isolated and the confined. You see, these are the services that attract heaven's attention. They may not win the commendation of blind men around us, but when you are converted and compassionate, you will see that this is exactly what the Lord is looking for. That's why we're looking at it today, how to have Christian compassion and brotherly love. Let's see what Jesus himself said. And this is what he says he will judge on the last day. He's not going to appreciate our dry kind of Christianity. He's not going to appreciate a kind of Christianity that has no love, practical love, that is not reaching out to people around us. Look at it from verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world for I was and hungered and ye gave me meat I was thirsty and ye gave me drink I was a stranger and ye took me in let's stop there for a moment you see sometimes uh, the devil makes us uh, unhappy because he tries to compare us with other people and you see, unfortunately, whenever we compare ourselves with other people, we are comparing ourselves on the wrong basis. We're using the wrong kind of evaluation. Oh, I'm not happy because, you know, I didn't go to university and college like so and so. If I went to college and I went to university, you know, I will be able to really serve the Lord. I will be able to preach the gospel. And then my reward will be great in heaven. But Jesus says no. That university education is not needed in making you to feed the hungry and making you to clothe the naked and making you to be able to take in the stranger. Other people say, you know, the problem of my life, and I don't know I'm going to rectify this, is that I'm a stammerer. And I cannot really preach in a dynamic way like some of these other people I see in the bus. And I see them in our church here and they preach and they emphasize the thing. And because I'm a stammerer, I cannot preach like that. How can I have reward in heaven? The Lord is saying the reward is not for the person that can preach. If he only preaches and he doesn't do what we're talking about tonight, when we get over there, you'll be shocked and surprised. If he ever made heaven, he'll be miserable over there. You see, you can be a stammerer and have great reward in heaven. Because this one, a stammerer can feed the hungry. He can clothe the naked. And he can give water to those who are thirsty. He can take care of strangers and the needy and the poor people. Or some people say, you know, my problem is that uh, the church is so large and they don't know me. And because they don't know me, they will never be able to put me in an important service. My friend, there is no more service that is more important than the one that is available for you to do in your Christian community, where you are. Because there are a lot of hungry people that do not know they are going to feed. That's a great ministry waiting for you around you there. There are a lot of people that are naked. They do not know how, how they will be clothed and how they will clothe their children. That's a great ministry waiting for you right there. 
There are many people who are fed up with life. They need comfort. They need uh, counseling. They need help. They need encouragement. That's a great ministry waiting for you over there. You know, other people, they say, I, I just not have the sense of rhythm and music because uh, when I try to sing, my voice goes off. And the people will be laughing at me. I wish I could sing like such and such, so and so. I wish I could play musical instrument like such and such and so and so. Because then I'll be serving the Lord. My friend, that is not a great service at all. You know the greatest service? There are more people that need food than need music. We, we don't all need music, but we need food. There are more people that need clothing than need singing. We don't all need singing. You see the people that are dying, that are sorrowful in the hospital, they need more care, they need more, uh, you know, more sympathy, they need the comfort of, that, of other people than music. What's the use of music when that man is dying and there is no helper and there is no comfort and there is nobody that can come around and cheer him up with a word of love? You see, we're looking in the wrong direction. Other people say, I've been trying my best since I came to the church. I became saved and I became, by, you know, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I've been reading the Bible, cramming the Bible, memorizing the Bible, storing up the Bible in my mind, in my head, so that when they interview me for area leader, zonal leader, coordinator, and they ask me, I can, you know, read from the book of Matthew from memory unto them, and I can recite the book of Revelation unto them, and I can go to Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and then go to Deuteronomy. I can quote, and then I will pass the interview. You can pass that interview and never make heaven. It is not how much Bible we know in the head. It is how many hungry people you have fed. How many naked people you have clothed. How many people that are sorrowful, that are strangers and rejected in society that you have taken in. How many people your life and your love has lifted up out of the dunk hill and you have ministered the love of Christ unto them. You see, there are people that think that, you know, if I can just be a prayer warrior, a prayer champion, a prayer giant, that will be all I want. You know, so that when I just command that tree to move out of that place, it's gone. When I command that thing to move out, it's gone. When I command that to move out, it's gone. But haven't you read the Bible? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I do not have love, charity, practical love flowing out from me, that will weep with those who are sorrowful, that will laugh and rejoice with those who are joyful, that will be patient and kind and gentle and loving and embracing people, and, and uh, that will share practical, practically all that I have with other people, if I don't have that, all the speaking in the tongues of men and of angels will be nothing. And if I have the faith, mountain moving faith, that I can move mountains, I have the mystery of the knowledge of the word of God, and I know the deep secret things of prophecy of eschatology, and I do not have this practical love, it profits me nothing. If I'm so fanatical that I say I've laid everything upon the altar, I can even give my body to be born, and I do not have the love we're talking about like this, You'll be among the goats on the last day. You'll be classified with people that did not have Jesus. Because, you know, it is not the activity. It is not the uh, open, uh, public kind of ministry and, and the performance that makes us to go to heaven. It is this practical grace of God flowing out from you and from me that you can feed the hungry. You can give water to the thirsty. You can take in the stranger. And Jesus said in verse 36, Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. You know, many times over here, Jesus referred to himself. He said, ye gave me meat. He said, ye gave me drink. He said, ye took me in. He said, ye clothed me. He said, ye visited me. He said, ye came unto me. Oh, and these people started to wonder that Jesus had already gone to the cross and died and raised, raised from the dead. And he had already gone to heaven before we were even born again. Because you see, he's talking about what is going to happen on the last day. It's bringing the judgment day back to us, making us to see it, a preview of what will happen on the judgment day. And they said, when did we see you? When did we ever come to you? 
When did we minister to you like this? Look at verse 38. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in? We don't remember. When did we see you naked and we closed you? We never remembered that. Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Oh, you are Jesus. You are never sick. Oh, yes, he said I was. You were never naked. Oh, yes, he said I was. You were not in prison. Oh, yes, he said I was. What's the secret of this in verse 40? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You understand that? Many people, if they have opportunity to minister unto Paul, they will. Those are the greatest, you know, in the, among the brethren. The apostles, the evangelists, the prophets, the pastors, and the teachers. If they had the opportunity to do something for a person like Peter, who was a, a person that had been known on record to walk on the sea, a person that came and preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 came to the Lord, if they had the opportunity to minister it to a person like Peter, they would do it joyfully. If they had the opportunity to minister to an international evangelist who is known all over the world and who is, you know, has been drawing thousands of people to the Lord, they will do it. But you see, you may never meet an international evangelist. You may never have opportunity to find a how to meet the need of the international evangelist. In fact, most of the time, the international evangelist, you know, from where he's coming from, is already provided for. He is not naked. He is not hungry. He is not thirsty. He has a ministry already. And he has, you know, where he draws his money and whatever. You know, the people that really need something are the least in the kingdom of God. And those are the people we don't want to touch. The illiterates. The poor people. The people that have no job. The people that are sorrowful. The people that are bereaved. The people that have no help at all. The people that do not have the things of this world. And Jesus said, in as much as you recognize them, you accepted them, and you did something to them, in as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I want you to begin to examine your life. Because you see, some of us, what we count as real Christianity is that when we wake up in the morning, we read our Bibles for hours. We pray for hours. Then when we're going to the place of work, we carry Bible with us. Every little time we have, instead of all the Bible you read in the morning, stop the reading of the Bible now, go out and touch the lives of other people. People are weeping in most of the offices. People are sorrowful in most of the offices. You read enough Bible in the morning. Instead of, you know, reading the Bible again, going to the toilet, reading the Bible, in the break hours, reading the Bible, every, what you read in the morning, what you read yesterday, go out now and wipe tears away from the eyes that are weeping. Go out and see the people that are hungry and feed them. Go out and see the people that are sorrowful and minister to them. But you know, the essence of the Christian life of some people is only reading Bible, memorizing Bible. Other people, they say, I have a prayer ministry. They see people that are dying. They see people that haven't... No, they're not going to touch them. They're not going to do anything for them. All they do is that they say, the measurement of my life is that I pray. Anytime they see that they are not praying, anytime they see that they don't spend five hours, six hours in praying and speaking in tongues, oh, they say, I'm growing cold now. I'm not spiritual anymore now. Their measure of spirituality is to neglect the poor and never think about them. Neglect the people that are hungry, never think about them. Neglect the barren and never go to comfort them. Neglect the people that their children die and never go to comfort them. Neglect the people that are naked and jobless and they are evacuated or ejected from their houses and never look at that. The measurement of their spirituality is that I pray five hours every day. They never wipe out the tears of those who are crying. They never lift up the people who are falling down. They never help the helpless. They never go to the orphans and the widows and the destitute and help them. I pray five hours a day. You'll be surprised you may not get to the kingdom of God. It is not the people that just pray. 
It is not the people that just read the Bible. It is not the people that say, Lord, Lord, and they do not do the things that the Lord wants us to do. Oh yes, Jesus prayed, but he cared for people. He went about doing good. He didn't have much of the things of this world, but all that he had, he gave to people. At last, he gave his very blood. You see, God so loved the world that he gave. And if all that you do is that you pray, all that you do is that you know Bible, all that you do is that you can preach in the bus, all that you do is that you say, you know, I know some verses of the Bible. When I come across a drunkard, I know what part of the Bible to quote, that the people will weep if you know how to make people cry. But you don't know how to make people happy you may never get to the kingdom of god the measurement of getting to the kingdom of god is not no, not knowing it's not that i know how to strike people i know how to preach in the boss i know how to convict people i know how to point at their evil i know this i know that do you know love practical love are you showing that love are you ministry to the people that are needing your community that is the very essence of our christian life in job chapter 29 Job chapter 29 from verse 13 the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy have you ever done that do you even know those who are widows around us you're sitting right now in the church do you know that you may be sitting with a widow on that bench where you are sitting? Do you ever say hello to them? Do you know they are lonely? Do you know they need help? Do you know they need uh, support? Do you know that they need clothing? Do you know that they need supply to minister to their regular day-to-day -day needs? Do you ever cause the heart of the widow to sing for joy? You eat all your food alone? You wear all your clothes alone? Even the clothes that you cannot wear again. Maybe you have, you have about three, four towels at home. And when another one is not even torn yet, and it is something that other people can use, you just put it on the ground to be mopping the floor. There's somebody who doesn't even have that to cover himself in the night. And then you say, I'm a Christian. I don't commit fornication. There are a lot of people that have never commit fun committed fornication that will go to hell. There are a lot of people that never drink, never smoke, never commit adultery, never have too many wives, only one wife. A lot of people that have only one wife that will go to hell. A lot of people that never smoke, never drink, that will go to hell. Why? Because the love of God is not in their hearts. Their kind of holiness is dry. No sympathy for anybody. No concern for anybody. They are so isolated and they so detach themselves from the people that are suffering. And they are not a people that, you know, as you see some of the ushers that, you know, walk around. Ushers, please excuse me. I need to make illustration. You see that sometimes they are wearing, that brother or that sister is wearing the same clothes all the time. But they love the Lord. And they are serving the Lord. And the clothes that we have, you know, they are just there. And we just, you know, pack them there. And the ones that are even better than what some of our people are wearing, we never give them out. And eventually we will just say, uh, that one will use it to rub the floor. The one you are using to rub the floor, if you give it to somebody, you'll be rewarded in eternity. All those things that we are wasting. You know how we eat food? Uh, you know those of us who have food, you cook, every, you cook double of what you can eat. You put everything on the table, you eat this one, you eat this one, and eventually after you have eaten, what is remaining is more than what you have even eaten. You throw it away to the dustbin because you, if it comes to the second day, you cannot eat. My friend, there are people that will eat that thing even if it is the third day. Even if it is not in a fridge, even if it is not well kept, there are people that are saying they will eat it. You know, sometimes when I move around, uh, some of these times I'm able to move around people in the country here, in, right in Lagos here in the city. I used to see some people, they'll be using stick to be looking for food in the dustbin. You know, if you are going on this road here, uh, you know, after church, you'll be seeing people, especially when it is early morning or when it is at night, when much pe or not when many people can see them, they'll be looking for sardine that somebody has thrown away. They'll be looking for a tin of milk that somebody has thrown away. They'll be looking for, you know, some kind of thing they can, some bread uh, still wrapped in paper that some of the people have eaten and thrown away. The things that you are throwing away, there are people that are looking for them. 
Do you know that people are hungry? And uh, outside this uh, country, uh, they, you know, moved around a little. And I see people, they will be looking at dustbin. They will be using stick to, you know, be looking for what they can eat. That's how some people are feeling. But you, when you cook your food, you cook your meal, you have it so much. And you never think that your northern neighbor is dying of hunger. In fact, you know, there are some of us uh, over here. There are some of our people here. Sometimes you hear that somebody has died. And uh, you go there and say, how did this person die? It's a member of our church. And uh, somebody will say, uh, I remember I saw him about three weeks ago in the church. Only two weeks ago, I didn't see him again. And then we go to the house. We see another person who is a believer coming to this church who is also living in the same house. And we say, ah, uh, brother, this person is living the same next door to you. When did he become sick? I don't know. The doctors tested him and they said the man was all right. What killed him is, uh, you know, hunger and uh, cold and he has nothing to eat and nothing to wear. And they saw that he has been having an ulcer. Eventually, he died of hunger. And uh, they said, uh, you are living, you are in the same church, in the same zone. Uh, have you seen him for the last two days? No, I didn't see him. Did you knock at his door? No. Why? <laughs> well, I was waiting on the Lord. You are waiting on the Lord and your brother next door neighbor now has died. He has gone to heaven. If you are not careful, you will go to hell. Are we not concerned that people are hungry? Are we not concerned that people are naked? Are we not concerned that people are needy and they are so poor and they need what we have? They need what we have. And you know, it is not how much I can preach. It is not how much I can pray. It is not how much I can, you know, quote the Bible. Even if I cannot quote the Bible, if I have Jesus within me and I'm able to do good and I love people and I clothe the naked and I feed the hungry. You may not be a great preacher. You may not be somebody who is, you know, coming on the pulpit over here. You know, we're so many. Not everybody will come over the pulpit here in one year. You know, there are only a few Sundays in one year. But all of us can reach out in love. All of us can reach out in love and clothe the naked and feed the hungry and help the people around us. Look at verse 15. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame was i to the lame instead of saying why is he blind does he not have faith in god can he not pray job said i didn't condemn the blind i became eyes to the blind if they wanted to go somewhere but they cannot go because they are blind i hold their hands i become their eyes i leave them there i do not allow their blindness to make them to feel inhibited restricted or confined into a particular place they need to go somewhere and uh, you know i will get time out of no time i will get opportunity out of uh, no opportunity i will make sure that if i see the blind i am their eyes they need to know something evaluate something i'm there available for them and then he said i was feet to the lame the lame man is thinking i want to go there but i cannot go Job said, I have my two feet, I will carry him on the back, and I will take him. There. Do you know there are people, if their husbands are losing their sight, they don't have any interest to take care of their husbands anymore. They are saved, they are sanctified, they are baptized in the Holy Ghost, they are speaking in tongues, they are leading house fellowship, and they are here and there. But if their husbands are becoming almost blind, they don't have any patience, any love, any care. For the husband that is becoming blind. Do you know there are people, if their wives are having arthritis or their wives are becoming lame and the wife cannot go here and there, and they will say, I cannot, uh, you know, waste time. I've got a ministry of preaching. I've got a ministry of going there and going there. I cannot wait for you and become your leg because, you know, we, we know that God can heal the sick. If you are lame and you cannot rise up and walk, that's your problem. I've, I've taken you to deeper life. I've brought you the, you know, the doctrine of healing. And you are by all these cases are there. If you want to rise up and walk, the cases are there. The power of God is available. No compassion. No mercy. And they are so brutal. They do not know that they, that wife that is lame will need their help. Do you know they are so-called Christians? If they see that their husbands or their wives are becoming lame and they cannot walk, they will be so ashamed of that husband, they can divorce. Or if, if they don't go to marry another person, they say, well, I cannot be taking, a, you know, one man, I just stay with one man, I take him to toilet, take him to bathroom, care for him, and do this and that. When will I preach? 
When will I lead us fellowship? When will I go for workers' meeting? If I am tied, tying myself to a man, the man that has become lame, eh, I know I will not marry another person, but because I have a prayer ministry, a preaching ministry, they will abandon their husband. They think they are going to heaven. They think that because of preaching and because of leading us worship, that, you know, I'm going to heaven. After I don't commit adultery, I don't commit fornication, there will be millions of people in hell who never committed fornication. Millions of people in hell who never smoked, who never drank. You see, Job said, I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor. Are you like that? I was father to the poor. You know, sometimes uh, there are people that they have the money. The money is just there. They don't know what they're going to do with the money. Well, if you don't know what you're going to do with the money, we have a lot of our children here, children of God and young people. They don't know how their parents will pay their school fees. They are, they are parents, but they're like orphans. If you say you have the money, you don't know how to spend the money. We have a lot of them that are looking for school fees. A lot of them that are looking for school books. A lot of them that are looking for clothing. We have a lot of people here. They don't know where they're going to live. After, you know, when they come, they have been in Lagos and there's no work and there's no accommodation. If they will just find a place shelter in the house of a Christian and just eat and have a place to sleep and be coming to church, they'll be happy in their lives. But you know, these people, they are Christians. The money is there. They don't know what they're going to do with it. The house is there, and the man just has a wife, and he has, uh, you know, about maybe two or three children, and there are maybe five, six rooms there. And what they are just putting there, they put old clothes somewhere, old food somewhere, this one. All those places you are putting all the uh, dilapidated, collapsing bicycles and everything that you have no use of, there are people that are looking for room only to lie down. Some people are not even looking for a room, they are looking for your veranda. They are looking for just the side of the road to lie down. But there are Christians, they are sanctified. They are speaking in tongues and baptized in the Holy Ghost. They never care. They don't know that anybody needs any help. But Job said, I was a father to the poor. Please understand, Job himself, uh, when he said, I was, at that time, he himself uh, had ten children. With the ten children, he still said, even though I have a wife and I have ten children, yet, and I'm caring for many servants, I'm caring for this, I'm caring for that, I am still father. I was father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched it out. And I break the jaw of the wicked, and I plucked out the spoil of his teeth. Now, this is the ministry of the real believer, the one that really knows the Lord and the one that wants to go to heaven. Let's look at James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. This is pure religion, pure religion. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. When it says you keep yourself unspotted from the world, what he's saying is this. That you know the people of the world, they will throw parties. And when they throw their parties, they invite rich people. And then as they are dancing, they'll be spraying money on people that don't need money. Their volvos are outside and you are spraying money on them. That's worldliness. What the Bible is saying that you are a Christian and you have the money. Because you don't want to spot yourself with the world, you will, instead of spraying money on the rich people, you will look for poor people and you spend the money on them. Instead of a calling party and the people that have eaten, look at the people that attend those parties. There are people that are dressed in fine clothing. There are people that already, they are even bigger than their size already. They are very fat. They don't need more food. They need fasting. They don't need feasting. The people that really need the food you are wasting, my friend, is the people that have nothing. And those are the people, if you are not going to support yourself with the world, don't behave like the worldly people. You are gathering the people that are fat. They need to reduce weight and you are still overfeeding them. Feed the people that have not got enough. That's Christianity. The people that know the Lord and they have been praying, Oh God, use somebody, use my brothers and use my sisters. Use somebody to be a blessing to me so that I don't die of hunger. I don't die of nakedness. Let the Lord use you and reach out to the people that are fatherless and widows and needy and the poor people among us. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. You know, these things I'm speaking about, brothers and sisters, there are people that did it before. 
But it says, let it continue until Jesus comes. It is not enough to just feed the hungry for one week, one month, one year. Let it continue. Jesus has not come yet. They see a lot of poor people keep on doing it. And uh, they see a lot of naked people keep on clothing them. A lot of helpless people keep on helping them. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. You don't forget your quiet time. Do you think quiet time is the only thing that is important in the Christian service? You don't forget to come for your workers' meeting on Saturday. Do you think that is the only important thing in your Christian life? You don't forget to come here on Sunday to worship the Lord. Do you think that is the only important thing? There are people that are crying and weeping around you. Can't you just, uh, you know, turn around and then spend some time and wipe away their tears? Can't you weep with those who are sorrowful and rejoice with those who are joyful? Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. What some people who say they are spiritual, what they do when they see that some people have a, a, some kind of bondage, some kind of problem, is that they'll be gossiping. They'll be saying, uh, you know, so-and-so, he cannot pray. He's not spiritual. He's having demonic uh, bondage. He's having attack. He's having, uh, you know, oppression. He's having, uh, if it were myself, I will use the name of Jesus. Uh, go to that house and use that same name of Jesus. If it were myself, I will plead the blood of Jesus. Yes, go there and plead the blood of Jesus. It is not by making fun of people that will show we are spiritual. It is not by, you know, gossiping about people. Ah, he has problem, he has problem. You know, so and so does not have job. Look for one for him. Go and, uh, go and tell him where the job vacancies are. It is not by making fun of people that will show we are spiritual. We show we are sanctified. We show we are powerful. We show we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. It is not by saying, ah, you know so and so. He doesn't have accommodation. He cannot feed his wife. He cannot send his children to school. His children passed a common entrance exam. But he cannot send his children. It is not by gossiping that we show that we are near God. It is by helping. It is by going to the house. Ah, young boy, what are you doing? Why didn't you go to school? And the young boy said, well, I have uh, finished uh, primary school. I even passed to secondary school. There's nobody to educate me. My friend, all the money is in the bank. If Jesus came tonight, all the millions you are hiding in the bank, if you ever go to heaven at all, the Antichrist will withdraw that money and spend. Why don't you spend a little of that for that boy now? And for the people that are around you now? And this is how we can show that we're spiritual. It says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. And them that suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. You know, if uh, you know, I just go my way, you go your way. We don't know when other people, other Christians are sorrowful. Is that church? Why are we together and yet we're apart? Why are we in the same church? Some are well fed, the others are hungry. Some will not wear one clothes two times and other people will wear the same clothes for one whole year in the same church. Some do not have accommodation at all and they are being kicked like football from this place to this place. Other people are living conveniently in mansions that uh, in dogs have accommodation, dogs have a room, uh, the pig have a shed, uh, the, uh, the poultry section have a, uh, occupy, uh, have a place to occupy and the each of the children they have single room to themselves my friend that all the rooms were given to the pigs and to the dogs to the animals look at your brother that was bought in the blood of Jesus Christ he has nowhere nowhere to stay at all and you say I'm expecting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes do you think he will be happy when he comes do you think he will reward you come and look at it Matthew chapter 25 from verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What did these people do? They committed adultery? No. Did they commit fornication? No. Were they drunkards? Not at all. Were they highway robbers? Not at all. What did they do? Let's look at it. This is what Jesus said. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. Is a sin of neglect. I was hungry and you gave me no drink. 
I was a stranger, and ye took, not, ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Have you ever visited hospital? Ah, I never go to hospital. I have faith in God. Since I became born again, my legs never visited hospital. How about your brother that is sick and is taken to hospital? Ah, it's because he does not have faith. If he had faith, he will never allow himself to have been taken to that hospital. And you have faith. You see, with that faith, a person can still get to hell. Faith that has no compassion, no love. There is no grace of God that is flowing out of your heart to that person that is suffering. It says, because I was sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, they even knew his name. They even know his Lord. It is not all that say, Lord, Lord, that shall get into the kingdom of heaven, but they that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. When saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister, did not minister unto thee. When Jesus said, you did not visit me, he didn't say that, uh, you know, you just knock at the door. How are you there? Oh, you are sick. Okay, let us pray. You never sit down. You never helped him to clean the house. You see that he's messing up that place. You never cleaned up the place. You never ministered unto him. That one is not ministering. That one is not visitation. When you visit a person, you know that that is representative of Jesus Christ. You only think of the pastor as representative of Jesus Christ. You only think of the apostle as a representative of Jesus Christ. You're only thinking of Peter and Paul as representatives of Jesus Christ. You are not thinking of that poor, naked, hungry, uh, uh, a man that is, you know, so thin and so lean now. You are not thinking of that person as representative of Jesus Christ. And that is representative of Christ. The one that has no food. The one that is so dirty. The one that has messed up all the all the uh, environment. He says, you minister unto him. Then they said, when did we see and we did not minister unto you? He said, then shall he answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Do you remember that rich man who feared sumptuously every day? We are not told he had many wives. We are not told he was committing adultery or fornication. We don't know. We are not told that he was an highway robber. We are not told that he got his money in a bad way. All we are told about him is that Lazarus was so poor and so ragged and so wretched, full of sores, he never took care of him. When he ate his food and the food remained, he threw it down to the dogs. And then Lazarus will try and, you know, get something out of it. And the dog will, you know, the dog was more healthy than even Lazarus. And Lazarus was a believer in the Lord. And he will not drive the dogs away. Lazarus was not asking, asking for a golden plate, a silver plate, a golden cup. He was even ready to eat it on the ground. He was not asking for chair and table, but the man never cared. Well, suffering will not continue forever. Lazarus went to heaven. And these people that are eating and eating, it will not continue forever. The rich man died. He went to hell. Where do you want to go? Are you taking care of people now? Are you showing the love of Christ to other people? Well, thank God judgment day has not come. You can repent today. You can say, Lord, I am sorry. I thought I was spiritual. I thought since I was saved and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues, I thought everything was all right. I now see everything is not all right. Can you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that he will give you the heart of love, the heart of compassion, the heart that is reaching out to other people wanting to take care of them, the heart that is asking for the welfare of other people, the heart that is able to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and help the helpless and busy the people that are confined and the people that are sick. Oh Lord, help me. Tell the Lord to help you. Tell the Lord to help you. Your fellow brother is there. What have you done? Your fellow sister is there. What have you done? Are you merciful? 
Are you compassionate? Are you loving? Are you sharing? Are you visiting? Are you encouraging other people? Are we going to remain selfish and think that we'll get to heaven? Are we going to remain self-centered? selfish isolated and think that we are going to get to heaven that way let the love of God flow through you let the love of Christ flow through you Do something to help other people. 